Um, welcome everyone um, to this evening's webinar. Um, my name is Narelle Quinn. I'm the Executive Director of Program Delivery and Service Enhancement for the Eastern Melbourne PHN. Um, tonight's topic, GPs, put your oxygen mask on first, is uh, the first in a series of webinars that aims to support general practitioners uh, to manage the less uh, visible ripple effects of the pandemic on wellbeing mental and physical health. Um, so the topics we've chosen range from the importance of GP self-care to be able to continue their role on the front line, supporting increased uh, or patients uh, incre feeling increased uh, anxiety or stress or managing ongoing health issues experienced uh, by people who have had COVID-19. And look, we've already had great feedback um, for tonight's webinar, acknowledging that it's been a very stressful and demanding six or more months for uh, GPs and people working in GP practices. Um, Kathy, if you'd like to change the slide. Uh, I think it's really important during this uh, week, being NAIDOC week, to um, acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and other people of the Kulin Nations whose unceded lands our work in the community takes place. We respectfully acknowledge their ancestors, elders, past, present and emerging. Um, before we begin this evening, we'll just cover a little bit of housekeeping as well. Uh, all attendees are on mute. You'll notice that uh, the usual chat box is not available. We will be using the questions and answer function, which you see just to the left of the chat box. Um, so please type in your question and press send. That allows us to um, record an answer against each individual question. We'd also like you to note that this webinar is being recorded. Um, none of the attendees are on camera, but our presenters are, um, but just note that it is being recorded and it will be available afterwards if you'd like to share, as well as the uh, presentation. I'm gonna hand over to our first speaker. Um, welcome, Jane, this is Dr. Dane Crow. Thank you. Thank you, Narelle. Uh, my name's Jane Crow. I'm a, a Melbourne GP, and we have Mari and Kathy and Anitha working in the background tonight, assisting with this webinar. Uh, it is a very apt title for GPs, put on your oxygen mask first. I can totally relate to that. Um, I'd like to tell you about our two speakers tonight. Uh, there's Dr. Kim Jenkins. She's a, a consultant psychiatrist, uh, medical director of the Victorian Doctors' Health Program. Uh, Chair of Council of Presidents of Medical Colleges and the immediate past President of the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. And we also have on the panel Mr Long Nguyen, who's a Rural Program Manager and Medical Director uh, from the Victorian Doctors Health Program. So Narelle has told you about the, um, the uh, housekeeping, but please keep your questions coming through. This is an interactive webinar. So if you put your, type your questions into the question and answer uh, section of your computer, your Zoom meeting, um, and I will relay your questions to the speakers. Um, if we run out of time, your questions will be given to the speakers so that their replies will be sent out to all attendees. So in January and February, the threat was looming and gaining momentum. Reports from Wuhan and Milan, uh, Milan were increasingly distressing and worrying. And then in March 2020, when the, when the pandemic hit Melbourne and the Grand Prix was cancelled, it was all so very real. Um, increasing number of cases coming from overseas, society was changing rapidly. Um, and a Melbourne GP had been diagnosed with COVID-19 and this was heavily publicised and politicised. And a lot of us GP, GPs felt really vulnerable, struggling with how we we're going to cope with all of this, with this unknown. Um, looking after our, our patients, our families, our colleagues, our income and our own health. So because there was no precedence, um, the information about this pandemic and then the guidelines to cope with this arrived in piecemeal and ever-changing fashion. So we would really like to run an audience poll now just to sort of um, see what, what's been the most caused you the most worry and anxiety over the last uh, eight months in relation to this pandemic. So if we could put the poll question up, please. Thank you. So we've got a, about, a, about 20 or 30 seconds to look at these answers. So implementing infection control measures at the practice, 
implementing personal infection control measures when consulting, ability to access PPE, concern about reduced income, concern about vulnerable patients not coming to the GP, telehealth and the impact on the quality of care and telehealth just challenges with <laughs> getting the connections. Okay, so have we got we got some answers there? So, so the top one is implementing infection control measures at the practice and the personal infection control measures when consulting and then ability to access PPE. Um, so quite a widespread uh, of responses there. So thank you, we'll close that. Thank you. So after... After eight months of adjusting to practicing medicine pandemic style um, with disruption to our domestic life, business life, professional life, family life, social and recreational lives, canceled or delayed holidays or no holidays, an exhausted list of Netflix series, um, give us oxygen. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce Dr. Jenkins, who will talk about GP stress, barriers to seeking help and practical strategies to managing stress. So thank you, Kim. Hi and good evening everybody. The bit that was missing from my CV is that I started life as a GP and yeah. I worked as a GP in Melbourne for 10 years before I uh, changed to psychiatry. So um, I still feel like I'm a GP at heart sometimes <laughs> and I haven't forgotten all my general medicine. Um, if, Long, if I could um, have my first slide and sorry, I can't share my own slide. So Long's gonna help me out here. If you could put that slide up for me, please. Um, I'm going to be talking about all the things Jane's been talking, said I'd talk about, but um, I think she's um, stolen a bit of the things I'm going to say anyway, so I might not repeat them. But um, Long, if we scroll through, maybe onto the next slide and the next slide, um, I might just start with this graph, which I think I found really useful for the course of this year. And a lot of the things Jane's just been talking about with that anticipatory anxiety are on the left-hand side of this chart in that pre-disaster phase. This is some work that was done by American researchers um, from theorists um, in about the year 2000. And it's a, um, a chart or a pathway through um, a disaster that was based in, in their disaster research. Um, and this is the standard one um, about our emotional um, course, our emotional journey through a disaster. Now, but all this work was putting together research from um, disasters that weren't pandemics. These were single event disasters like a tsunami or an earthquake, something that happens, you see it coming and you have this very short pre-disaster phase, whereas we had a much longer pre-disaster phase here in, in, in Australia because we could see it all unfolding overseas. And so our anxiety levels were going up and up in that pre-disaster phase rather than just being sort of high and a bit plateauy. When the disaster usually hits, there's actually a slight decrease. Um, people get... Um, and on an emotional low, but then we rally very quickly into this heroic phase and it's a doing phase and we start working 24 seven or you know even more hours than that because we wanna conquer this thing and we use up all our energy and the adrenaline's flowing and there's lots of cortisol around and all those stress hormones are happening. And that takes us through that heroic phase where we're all pulling together, we can, we're all in this together, we can, we can beat this, onto a honeymoon phase. And this graph, they, there's the honeymoon phase is, is pretty short in this. You know, you can't live on those high adrenaline levels for very long. And people drop off into that disillusionment phase. I think for what's happened in the pandemic, this graph needs a bit of mod, um, modifying because I don't think we dipped down that rapidly into the disillusionment phase. We more sort of slid into disillusionment because because this wasn't a single event and the things were always changing with the pandemic, 
we had more and more challenges to deal with each time. So we kept sort of like having mini um, heroic phases and mini honeymoon phases. But then certainly in, in Victoria, once we got into the second lockdown, we were really in those emotional lows, those troughs of disillusionment and feeling really tired and really worn out. And then this graph has this sort of like, sort of move into the um, reconstruction, the recovery phase at about the first year anniversary. But we've not been through a pandemic before and we don't know what, what our movement emotionally through into that reconstruction phase is going to be. And I think that instead of being quite a sort of steep um, line going up into reconstruction and recovery, it's going to be a much slower climb into that because we've got all the secondary effects of the pandemic as well. The financial strain that people are having, we, we talked about the, the second wave of the emotional and the mental health aspects of the pandemic as well. So that sort of working through the grief is going to be a lot, lot slower. Um, and we'll still have things like anniversary events to deal with. Um, but we'll slowly go into that reconstruction phase. And you'd like to think now we're out of lockdown, we're in that reconstruction phase, but we're still living with that uncertainty, that anxiety that there might be a third wave and we don't know what's around the corner, which is very different from um, the, the usual disaster um, research. Um, if I go on to the next slide, everybody's seen this slide and I think most of us the past, um, since about March, I've been somewhere right at the top of the yellow orange level, just way to tipple down into the into the into the red zone of burnout and anxiety and things. And the next slide. And all of us have been forced into this sort of situation. Life hasn't been like it was supposed to be. We've had to let go and try and find some joy in what was actually going on around us. Otherwise, we go under. And the next slide is you know it's only when things aren't normal anymore we've actually realized how special the normal yeah. things are and as you can tell I'm a bit of a fan of pinching things off social media and <laughs> and, and talking to them but I thought it's seven o'clock at night we don't need too academic a talk we <laughs> um and things um if I have the next slide which I have just borrowed about the importance of physician wellness. And this was from an article in The Lancet in 2009, where they adopted a quote from Winston Churchill to make their point that physician wellness, i.e. medical practitioner wellness, us, is, was a missing quality indicator and in um, various many health services. And it's incredibly important We're the best asset that the health service can have and we deserve to look after ourselves and be healthy. Um, and the next slide, I won't go through all of the things in here, but I'm, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about stress and burnout, compassion fatigue and self-compassion, which is one of the topical issues in doctor's health at the moment. And it's never been more relevant than it has been now during the pandemic. Um, but be next slide, please. <laughs> But before that, I do that, I think for all of us, it's really important to remember that, you know, we're doctors, we're not some sort of automaton, we're not superhuman, we can get the same illnesses as everybody else. And practicing medicine is inherently stressful, even when there's not a pandemic on. But we need to make sure that the ill effects of the stressful occupation that we all have are minimized. And also, we all have a ethical responsibility to make sure that we ourselves and the organizations we work with aren't agents for poor health in our colleagues. And an important one here, which is speaks to the barriers to, to getting help when you need it, is we need to make sure that we allow, the profession allows its own to get adequate help when needed, that we do let people have time off to go to their own doctor and time to check out and moments of mindfulness that we're going to talk, talk about later to look after their own health. Um, we've all had a whole range, sorry, long next slide, please. We've all had a range of really probably unusual or unaccustomed feelings 
during the pandemic. And I think one of the most helpful things is actually to recognize that a lot of what we're feeling actually is a condition. It may not be an illness, um, but a lot of what we've been through does have a name and it's recognized and it's a valid experience. So I'm just gonna have a slide on each of those and I can come back in questions to expand on any of them more if people want to. So if we go on to burnout, the first next slide, please. Here's some warning signs of burnout. And this is an interesting list and this shows my age because I've put delay doing paperwork in there. But any of the symptoms that are in the DSM depression checklist may actually be a warning sign of a burnout. And there can be a very fine line between burnout and depression. And if you think of it as a bit of a continuum with stress at one end through to burnout, through to depression, it's off, that's often the sort of trajectory that we can see. Um, this list makes me smile a little bit as well because dreading to see patients, well, we all do that. Some, we all have that thought sometime and we all have our heart sick patients. And chronic complaining, well, some people just complain anyway because that's their personality. Um, but, you know, a significant loss in the confidence in your own ability, just feeling like you can't do it anymore. Fantasizing about a changing career, like, you know, leaving medicine or at one stage I was... I, my fantasy was that I was going to be an interior decoration, make cushions. Um, and the last one here is a real warning sign is reliance on drug and alcohol to unwind. We can all, and I think it's perfectly okay to enjoy a glass of wine at the end of the day, but it's when that wanting a glass of wine becomes needing a glass of wine. Just, you know, a bit of self-check, a bit of a flag goes, that warning flag comes up, am I burning out? Is something else going on here? I think the important things about this list is, we all operate at different levels anyway of each of those things. And like I sort of joked earlier, some people complain all the time. But what is important is if you notice a significant difference in how you normally operate. And it's that change in a negative direction that should be a, a, you know, a warning sign for you. I'm going to talk the next slide, please. Connected closely connected to, to burnout, and I think this is really common for GPs and psychiatrists, is this concept of compassion fatigue, that we just feel like we're drained, we've got nothing left to give, we've been looking after people all day, and there's nothing left for our family when we get home, or there's nothing left for ourselves. And because we have that extra social connectedness with our patients and their families, and because of the nature of the work that we do, there is that emotional engagement with people and we are giving all day and often not sort of allowing ourselves or the system to, um, and the, or the situation we find ourselves in at work doesn't allow us to recharge and replenish our reserves. And so we can have that, com that condition of compassion fatigue. If I can have the next slide as well. And another really closely related thing, which I think has come up for many people in the times of the pandemic is moral distress. It's closely related to burnout, but moral distress is much more about like when we have a put in really distressful situations. And I think sort of like a, a typical one to cite during the pandemic has been um, older people or um, people in, in palliative care who aren't allowed to have their their relatives with them to be with them when they you would most want to be with loved ones at the end of their life and it's that moral distress of weighing up more um two choices one is that of i, I understand it i get that we've got to have um uh infection control and people should not be visiting older people in in nursing homes or um in palliative care versus hey it's just not fair that i have to make that choice um or in a hospital setting, what, what came in that anticipatory anxiety was all thoughts about, will we have enough ventilators to go around for people in intensive care? And how do we make that decision? And if you reflect on your own practice, you can probably think of times during the pandemic when you've been faced with that. It's not fair. I can't make that decision. I shouldn't have to make that decision. Um, next one I was going to talk about was just about trauma. I'm being, next slide, sorry, long was about 
trauma and about vicarious trauma. And clearly we all know that direct trauma is when we experience it ourselves. But I think for all of our work um, during the pandemic in, in general practice and psychiatry and some other medical disciplines as well, I'm sure, is this concept of vicarious trauma, how we get traumatized by the indirect exposure to the event. And because of that sort of empathy we have with our patients and that emotional engagement we have with our patients, we can sort of like experience um, through in our imagination or we can um, participate in the experience of another when they tell us horror stories. And not just during the pandemic, but if you have patients that come into you and share, you know, horrific stories in their life, you can go home at the end of the day a bit traumatised yourself from hearing those stories and, under, and having empathy with their situation. Um, a little bit on the next slide about the importance of self-compassion. And this is what we as doctors are not very good at. And this is probably one of the barriers to us getting help when we need it. And you can divide the barriers to getting help up into the internal ones that we generate within ourselves. We're doctors, we're supposed to know all the answers, we know how to look after other people. Um, it's a bit shameful and embarrassing when we don't know how to look after ourselves and we can beat ourselves up if our own health isn't good at the moment. And the external barriers of my job's too busy. I can't get time off. I'm letting somebody else down. Nobody can cover me. There's too many patients. My patients need me. The people I work with need me. The team needs me. And so there's those external um, barriers to getting help. And also things like, you know, I don't know who to go to for help. Um, and those very practical issues. Um, but then there's the internal ones as well, the self-compassion, our inability to be kind to ourselves. But to have true um, self-compassion, it's, it's, it's more than being kind to yourself. It's because we need to be aware of our common humanity and because of that, we can feel connected to others rather than alone in what we're going through. And it requires us to be mindful. And when we are act behaving and thinking in a mindful way, we can actually have an awareness of the experience, the pain that we're going through in a balanced way. And we don't do a lot of unhealthy denial that doctors are very good at. And we don't um, go up, go the other way and just exaggerate our pain. And you can read there the quotes from the Dalai Lama, if really good medical source for quoting. Um, we'll go with the Dalai Lama. If you don't love yourself, you cannot love others. And then, okay, so we've all had these difficult feelings on the next slide, please, dealing with them. And I'm probably going to completely run out of time already. Um, and you're going to, you're going to wave at me when I'm running out of time, aren't you? Um, I'm going to talk a bit about how we deal with some of them. So next slide, please. This is just to acknowledge how tough it is, it is for us to have that role reversal and to receive care rather than give it. Um, I've got a slide about the importance, next slide, of self-care. And again, I've, I've taken this off social media, but I think it's an acknowledgement that we are all different and self-care is means different things to different different people and we all have different coping strategies and ways to self-soothe. Um, the problem with COVID is that um, a lot of our coping strategies haven't been accessible to us, especially if it meant catching up with friends or going out and, um, and having a good time socially. But whatever works is basically the message here. Um, the next slide I'm going to miss because resilience is, a, is not a good thing to talk about here. Can I have the next slide, please? One of the most protective things that all of us have got is connectedness. And that's been particularly hard in the pandemic because we know that for our mental health and our coping strategies, feeling connected to others is one of the most protect, protective things. Um, and it may be family and friends or a club or... and our connections to the outside world actually help us who define who we are inside. 
Um, but that's been difficult in the pandemic because the message has been social isolation. And the next slide is here because I thought it was a lovely sort of thought during the pandemic about there's times when we all we can do is accept that we can't control things. And we're all type A personalities and we want to be in charge and we want to control things and know all the answers. But actually, it re the pandemic's really brought home to us. Sometimes all we can control is how well we let go of that control. Um, I'll put up the next slide, but I will not say much about this except to say that having hobbies and activities outside medicine is not a new idea. This is Osler from 1909, recognised that having a life outside medicine was a good idea. And the next one actually speaks to something really protective for us. Humour is a very mature defence mechanism. And I think sometimes like losing your sense of humour is a very sensitive sign that, hey, I'm burning out or I might be getting depressed. And a change, you know, a significant loss of your sense of humour, even, a, you know, just something that you would usually find humorous and you can't raise a smile. Oh, warning bells, get some help. And here, I am coming to the end, I promise you. Um, the next slide, please. Um, if I could see everybody, I'd go, who's got animals? And then I'd go, my poll would go, who talks to their dog? And then it would be like, whose dog understands them? And this is here to say that this dog's called Ginger and her owner's been droning on for hours. And poor G Ginger realised she wasn't cut out to be an emotional support dog after all. So message there is, if your dog's not listening to you anymore and solving it by talking to your dogs, you need to get help. And next slide. And the times to get external help is when you are keep repeatedly asking yourself, is what I'm feeling normal? Your usual coping strategies aren't working. And really, I think if you that sense of despair and despondency extends between beyond the, the particular issues and the stressor that's been stressing you out. Um, and if you're not functioning at work. And the next slide, please. This is a really important message to us as doctors and sometimes our resistance to getting help, that feeling of I'm a doctor, I should know all the answers. I, I can help everybody else, why can't I help myself? And this is, um, you know, if I say, have you actually, do you want to go and see a therapist, a psychologist or a psychologist, I'm not telling somebody they're crazy. I'm, what I'm saying is, you deserve this. You deserve to have somebody objective um, um, who can actually help you process what you're going through at the moment. Um, and this is, I think, one of the, the biggest barriers to us, that internal barrier that we don't let ourselves, ourselves allow that. Um, I've got some pictures, some, um, here I've got some organisations and um, initiatives that I've been involved with through this year, just across a spectrum of, um, of help. And we can come back to each of those if we, if we want. But I've put Pandemic Kindness up there because that's an online resource. I've put um, Hand in Hand Peer Support up there because that's a non-clinical, a pre-clinical um, peer support that where we can join with others in the similar situations that that help us through the pandemic and I've got VDHP that Lon's going to tell you a bit about there as well. Um, next slide. This is my very self-indulgent slide about putting on oxygen masks. I want advanced planning. This is my coping strategy and it hasn't been accessible to me during the lockdown so I'm, I've been looking at pictures and dreaming about it but I wouldn't take you out with me um, in Port Phillip or anywhere else unless you had your life jacket on so I haven't got oxygen masks I've got life jackets in this one I wouldn't let you come out with me on the boat unless I've gone through the, the man overboard drill with you where I'd say to you, I don't want you swimming away. I want you to stay still and tread water till we come and get you. We'll come and get you. And I'd be saying to the rest of the people, if somebody else falls overboard, don't take your eyes off them. 
keep looking for them and spotting them so we make sure we go back to the right place to pick them up. And I'd be saying, um, we've got enough life jackets for everybody. We've got flares on the boat my, and I know how to radio back to um, the club if we need extra help. I know how to put out a mayday call. And I think that apart from, you know, what, miss, having missed my hobby for about nine months, um, I think this is a really important thing about all this happens before. It's all advanced planning. You can't wait till you're in the middle of a disaster and think, who can help me? So I think one of the most important things for us, well, anyone um, really, particularly those of us in healthcare, is you know, just take a few moments and on a sheet of A4 or, or you know, iPad or something, jot down a few sort of scenarios and who would be your main support person or where you'd get help in that time. Who's your GP? Who's your dentist? Who's your supervisor if you had a, a clinical issue you wanted to help with? Who can you go to for mentoring? Um, don't wait till you've got toothache to find a dentist. And I've just got a few last thoughts because I tried to, if I can have the next slide, I tried to find some positive side effects of COVID. Um, for many of us, it's, there's been increased connections with new colleagues and new online friends. We've had to upskill and find different ways of doing things. Who knew I could find my way around a Zoom when I didn't even know what Zoom was <laughs> at the beginning of the year? But we've all had to find new ways of doing things at work. And some of them have been really tricky and tough, but some of them are actually better than what we did before. And um, I think a lot of us have really surprised ourselves with how flexible we are when we have to be. Um, and I've put more time with family there as a plus or a minus, because it might depend on where, you where you're coming from and what your viewpoint is. But I think we've all had to learn new coping strategies. But where, what I think one of the most positive things that's come through COVID is that it's easier and less stigmatizing for, to seek help. Everybody is supposed to be doing it tough in COVID. So if you say you're doing it tough in COVID, it's not castle carry the same stigma um, as previously when you do go and reach out for help. You're not meant to be coping at the moment. It is tough. Um, and so we can say, I'm not doing too well. Um, one of the things that I think was it's also um, really important to remember with, with COVID though, is that all the emotions I've described are understandable we're in a really extraordinary um, situation. And um, we don't want to be sticking um, pathological labels on things and creating diagnosis for people when there isn't a diagnosis um, and pathologizing the situation. But we don't want to be missing significant mental illness as well. So we have to be on our toes a bit to sort of, is this a normal reaction to an abnormal situation? Or is this an indicator of something more severe going on? And my very last slide is this one. Given that we've had a not very nice year and we can't do anything about the beginning of the year, um, this C.S. Lewis quote is, you can't go back and change the beginning. But we're all where we are now and we hope we can change the ending of the year. So thank you for listening. And I'll come back on the agenda in, in a little bit to do a bit of mindfulness. Thank you, Kim. So, am I on? Yes, you are, Jane. Okay, I can't, oh, I suppose I'm on the wrong gear. Sorry about that. Um, Kim, thank you so much. There was so much there to unpack. Um, I love the fact that you could put a name to the to the, the emotions and the roller coaster ride we've uh, we've been experiencing. I do think um, it has been prolonged and protracted, and uh, you know, um, the advanced planning list was a great idea, and um, just you know how you normalise seeing a psychologist because I think I've been you know um, on my own experience I've felt very down, distressed at times, but I don't want to offload on other people. I know they're going through the same thing, and mm -hmm. I feel that so 
uh, normalizing that's terrific. So thank you so much for the for that uh, talk. So uh, first of all, uh, there are no I can't see any questions coming through in the Q and A box. So if anyone's got any questions for Kim, please um, start putting them through. But what we're going to do now, just going to um, we're going to look at the chat box on your Zoom link here. So check the chat. What what are some of the things that have kept you, the audience? What has what's helped you um, just keep okay or keep afloat in this hard time? So let's just uh, thank you. We've got someone who is talking through. It's fantastic. So Zoom exercise group has been fantastic. Okay. Yoga, walking to work, not drinking after work, <laughs> <laughs> walking. I know Kim would be love to be sailing, uh, getting outdoors, walking, walking, meeting my sister for a walk. Great. Yes, yeah. Yep. I've been doing a bit of painting. This keeps me going. Series, series on Netflix. <laughs> the Bureau. I've heard that's very good. Um, taking a few, do a few days off here and there, gardening. All five series, Lisa. <laughs> must be good. <laughs> I've heard it's terrific. <laughs> I've watched one episode. I've got to get stick with it. All right, daily mindfulness meditation has been great. Thank you. All right, there's somebody there who's, who can probably um, give this mindfulness set a little session I'm going to yeah. do next. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so that's put that away. So, um, so Kim will briefly give us some self-care techniques and then we'll go to some questions. So please start putting some questions for Kim. Otherwise, I'll be asking them all myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Long, if we could just um, do the share screen again. And I've just got one slide I want to put up now. Um, any luck there? <laughs> Long, are you there? Maybe he's um, dropped off. He's no, dropped off. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be working. I apologise. Okay, I've just got one slide, okay. mindfulness slide. Ah, oh, something's happening right at the very end, very last slide. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely, okay. Um, I don't know where everybody who's attending this webinar is at the moment, but hopefully you're in a fairly quiet place um, and not trying to sort of um, cook the dinner and put the children to bed and do sort of 10,000 things all at once. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a little about, bit about being mindful and now I'm aware that there's somebody who may have a lot more expertise in mindfulness than I do um, who's on the webinar but I just thought this picture actually sums up what mindfulness is. The left-hand bubble is the is the owner of this dog. There's a few dog themes in my talks but um, whose mind is just full of everything and that's most of us during the day and that's how we feel in our working day and between patients and um, what I've got to do next and oh I haven't done this before I left and I've got um, anxiety about what I've got to do when I get home and the we don't enjoy the walk that we're on and there's the dog going along thinking hmm, here's some nice trees and the sun shining this is glorious um, so that's that's mindfulness it's actually being in the here and now. And I've had a bit of training in mindfulness and there's a few things that to talk about in just little ways that we can build into our days, how we can be more, we can just have moments of mindfulness and not, you don't have to have half an hour, you don't have to take huge times out of your day, but just little moments of mindfulness and I sort of divide my sort of like mindful moments up into about four things and one is just sitting and in most of the mindfulness training I've ever done 
they get you just to sit and I'll get you to do that now if you can, assuming that everybody's on a reasonably comfortable chair and you've got your feet flat on the floor. And with sort of half your mind listening to what I'm saying, just sit up straight and keep your eyes open and be aware of where your feet are and what your feet feel like in your shoes. And you can wiggle your toes around and just sort of think, oh, never knew it felt like that to wiggle my toes. And you can sort of think about how your shoes or your socks feel on your feet. And if you've got your hands on your lap, think about, hey, what your trousers or your skirt or whatever feels like under your hands. And just have a think about your hands. Are they cool or are they warm and sticky? And then just begin to breathe. Because the second bit of, I think, having a mindful no moment is just thinking about your breath and your breathing. Because when we're we all know that sort of when we've got a really stressful day and everything's coming down on top of us and we're anxious, our respiratory rate goes up, our pulse rate goes up and our blood pressure goes up. And if you could just sort of think about your breathing and breathe in a mindful way, I'll go through just a quick breathing exercise. I've got a psychologist colleague who teaches people 7-11 breathing, which is breathing in to seven and blowing out to 11. And you can do that one if you like. But the one I prefer is, I think of it as a square. If while you're sitting in your comfortable position, maybe just put your hands on your lower abdomen at the moment. And if you breathe in, really slowly to the count of five, breathe down into where your hands are. So just to five, and as you breathe in on that in breath, those hands should move forward. If you were lying down, your hands would move towards the ceiling. But breathing into five, then hold it there for five. And when you've got your five, Breathe out slowly to five and your hands will come back towards um, your spine again and then hold it for five. So what you've created is like a square of breathing into five, hold for five, out to five and hold for five. And if you just concentrate on doing that, for a few moments. I can't do it because I'm talking at the same time as doing it and I can't see everybody else and I don't know whether people are uh, following my suggestions or not but if you do that a couple of times in slowly to five in three notes hold for five blow out slowly three mouths for five hold for five And when you're doing that breathing exercise, it's actually really hard to think of anything else apart from your breathing. And you really are in the moment. And the benefit of doing that one is that your breathing slows down. I'm not sure if you took your blood pressure before and after you did that exercise, it would come down a wee bit anyway. Um, Long, if I can do the unsharing of the screen now, I'll just talk a little bit about two other aspects that of being mindful that I think are really helpful. Um, with, you know, I'm one of those people whose relaxation likes to be active and I've never been a great fan of yoga or meditation or anything, but I did discover mindful walking. And it's, I can't really explain it all now, but um, we could all, maybe if we could escape from our busy work and our busy practices, have 
even just a 10 minute mindful walk where you aren't actually thinking about what's going on at work and what's going on at home and what all the million and one things you've got to do actually just thinking about the walk that you're going and what it feels like your heels strike on the ground and, and as you roll through your foot um i would for those who'd like to be a bit more active in their things i um there's actually quite a a really sweet um video on youtube which is a called it's called a mindful walk through king lake um national park um and it's one that is produced by um parks victoria and it's got one of their park rangers taking you on a mindful walk through king lake and it's all beautiful there now and it's all sort of come back to life after the bushfires and here's this sort of very sort of ordinary middle-aged man of a well certain stature just being mindful in the park and actually that was quite a beautiful thing to watch during the pandemic because we couldn't go out for a walk ourselves and so having this vicarious positive vicarious experience of somebody else having a mindful walk um, so if you like your mindful moments to be a, a little bit more active I'd commend that one to you the other thing to practice occasionally which is really easy is because we all do it every day is a bit of mindful eating we all too often just gobble down our food on the way to something else and if we can find that you know that sandwich or that snack we're having we can actually slow down and eat in a mindful way you don't have to do the let's take 10 minutes to eat a sultana and think what this sultana's texture is like the, the, the classic exercise you don't have to do that but to fit in a little bit of mindful eating during the day is good as well. And I know in general practice, there isn't time to have a, necessarily to have a mindful moment between patients. And I'm now very fortunate in psychiatry that I can do that. If I'm working on half hour appointments or 50 minute hours, I could have, in theory, five minutes between patients where I can do the mindful breathing or I could um have i could sit and be mindful of feeling about what the my surroundings feel like and just lose the stresses of one patient and not carry them through to the next patient and i know that that is much much harder to do in general practice um but that's really what i was going to sort of share with you tonight a few suggestions about mindfulness and simple mindfulness activities thank you kim thank you so much um, it's so relevant to our day-to-day -day practice and uh, we've got patients who are very stressed and, and we're just as stressed and trying to be trying to heal the healer. Um, now, I'm not sure if there are any questions that have come up. Can you? I can't see any on my sheet. Is that correct? So no questions so far. No questions so far. I think everyone's just, I think you've answered everyone's questions, Kim. I don't know. <laughs> it's been, it's been... I've been that to everybody's gone to sleep. <laughs> okay. Wake up, wake up. <laughs> I must say, um, Jane, I tried to put in a question in the Q&A box and I wasn't able to enter one. So I'm just wanting to check, maybe using the chat function, um, if people want to enter questions in there because I actually couldn't enter a question into um, the chat function. Uh, sorry, the Q and A as we okay. had. Here are some questions coming through now. So, oh, there's a couple there. Uh, so we have a question about: Can you give an example of mindful eating? Ah, oh, I can. Um, actually, I'll give a very personal example. Um, a few years back, many um, I went to a lunchtime meeting about eating disorders, and it was really. And the talk afterwards was. Um, there was no dessert at this. They gave everybody a um, mini Mars bar was everybody's dessert. And they told us to actually hold off eating it because that was going to be part of the talk. And we had to eat this mini Mars bar in a mindful way. We had to look at it, smell it, um, think about the texture of it, um, think about what taste we anticipated. We had to take a little bite off it and see what it really tasted like. And not just to gobble back the whole lot, but to take a little bite and see what it tasted like and notice whether it was sweet. It was incredibly sweet. We had to notice the texture in our mouths 
we had to notice about whether we were actually really enjoying it. Um, and it took an awful long time to eat this mini Mars bar. I couldn't finish it when I, when I was eating it in a mindful way because I realised how disgustingly sweet it really is. And I don't think I've ever eaten one since, but I'm not suggesting that by doing some mindful eating, you actually um, actually you know, put yourself off food and, be, and, um, and things, but it's slowing down when you eat and actually really at that point in time, not having a conversation with somebody, not actually eating while you're doing your notes. It's actually, I am having my lunch now. This is whatever sandwich I prepared for myself this morning and noticing what it actually tastes like and actually thinking about the process of eating. Um, you can do it with anything that you do. And many of the coping strategies we have are actual mindful, mindfulness activities because if our mind is not there and then in what we're doing, we stuff up. And I, I, I've, I've shown you my sailing example, but I would, I would say that for 50% of the time I'm sailing, it's a mindful activity mm. because I'm not, if I'm not there in the moment, and, and that's why it's so, um, I find it so relaxing. Um, but again, whatever we do, we can do it in a mindful way. Thank you. I've got another question for you, Kim. So how would you manage the patient whose approach is, I've had enough, we just need to get on with living with this virus? Whoa. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sick of it. I, it's, uh, I think, is I that try, right, Lisa? I, I hope it's said the right way. I try and... Um, find some empathy for that that viewpoint and I would try I think I'd have to um, acknowledge that I I didn't have the same opinion and I would acknowledge to myself if not to the patient that I was actually quite angry with them for not appreciating everything that we were mm. trying to do for them and help them and mm. but I don't think I'd try not to say that to the patient or let it show but I'd be seeking out some of my colleagues afterwards to go, I had this horror patient today yeah. <laughs> who uh, invalidates everything that we've been going through and everything that we are trying to do. <laughs> mm. um, and the whole, the whole political side that comes into the yeah. whole fray, yeah. Oh. All right, well, thank you. I think that's um, all the questions we have. So thank you for those. Um, so I'd, I'm just kind of on my running sheet here now. Um, so I'd like now to introduce Mr. Long Nguyen about the mental health service available for GPs. Hi, everyone. Um, just bear with me. I'm going to share my screen. But at the first off, I'd just like to thank Eastern Melbourne PHN for inviting us and giving us this opportunity. Um, to present. Uh, who, who are we and what do we do? We're a free confidential independent service. Um, we're available 24 hours by phone. Prior to COVID, uh, we were the only service in Australia where a, a participant or a doctor or a medical student could come in and it was completely free. There was no Medicare or anything like that. Um, and yeah, we were completely unique in Australia in that sense. Um, because of COVID now, it's, it's either via phone or Zoom or something there. So we apologise. Uh, we kind of had to make that call earlier this year not to see anyone face to face, just to keep our clinicians safe as well, to ensure that we had continuity of service. Um, but hopefully with things going the way they are, we'll probably, fingers crossed, things will go back to you know, normal and, and operating. Um, but the idea is that it's doctors looking after doctors here. Um, and that's something that uh, is really kind of at the core of the Victorian Doctors' Health Program. Uh, we're open to all doctors and medical students, past and present. Um, I, I, I say this a lot, um, but, you know, we've had doctors that are living in the UK and have called us because they've studied in, in Melbourne and we've seen them. 
Uh, we've had doctors that have retired and called up and asked, can I see you? I'm not a doctor anymore. Said, and the medical director at the time said, once a doctor, always a doctor. And of course, we'll see you. Um, the, the other thing too was something that Kim mentioned is that we have a, we recommend that every doctor has their own doctor or every doctor has their own GP. So doctors need doctors too. Now, if you don't have one, um, please call us. We can find one for you. And also, if you'd like to be a doctor that, that would help out other doctors, please call us as well and we'll get you on our treatment panel um, as well. And we also do some uh, training there for Docs for Docs as well. So that's something that we're doing. We're doing something in a, in a couple of weeks and we're going to run them routinely as well. So if any doctor would like to be on our referral network uh, treatment panel, please do call us. Um, something else we have is uh, case management for AOD and that runs uh, every week. And one of the, the bonuses that, you know, we're looking for positive things um, during COVID. I've managed to grow my hair out very long <laughs> and it's very lucky. And I'm, quite, I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> but um, with the AOD group, because it was based in Melbourne uh, and they used to meet face to face, it, it kind of excluded some of the uh, rural doctors. But because we've gone online, a lot of the rural doctors have managed to attend and everything and and also one of the the other feedback is that the, the pets have been involved as well so all the doctors animals and all that have come on board and, and and butted in during the zoom sessions and everything so it's it's been very conducive and very beneficial in in that sense for them as well long what is aod uh, alcohol and other drugs oh thank you um you know some barriers to seeking help we've kind of gone through this um you know kim's kind of mentioned it uh, but how can we help? We're the first point of call. Uh, we'd like to think of ourselves as a kind of safety net. Now, there are roughly about 30,000 doctors in, and medical students in Victoria. Um, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of other services there, but we'd like to think of ourselves as a safety net that we don't want anyone to fall through the cracks. You know, that, that's our kind of lofty goal. Um, on that point, we, we, we had a survey a little while ago and this is kind of, uh, I'm going off on a tangent, but one of the questions is where would you like to see yourself in five years? And, and it was quite lofty of me and, and it was a bit tongue in cheek, but I said for us to not exist really. But, and that, that's a really aspirational goal in the sense that if we didn't exist, then doctors would be really healthy and, and all that. Now that's, that's a, a bit of a pipe dream, but that's, that's what we kind of aiming towards anyway. Um, we manage referrals, we support stress and burnout, like King has mentioned, return to work. Uh, we listen without judgment or prejudice. So in our office, we've got a little hand scroll, uh, written note that's hung up in the on the office notice board and it was written by a participant and just said, thank you for listening without judging. And it's kind of scrunched up, but it's pressed out and that's really important, something that you can feel comfortable coming in and you can talk. Um, we're also, like I said here, we also... Uh, I guess, take care or cover for Tasmanian doctors as well. Um, so if anyone was from Tasmania, I know they're not, but yeah. And, and most of all, most important, we're here if needed. And, and I think that's the most important thing. You know, you can use your EAP, you can use your support network, but if none of those things really feel comfortable for you, you can call us. And that's 24 hours, 365 days of the year. Um, and how can we help? So we have... There's a few things. There's the Doctors for Doctors, which is kind of the, the blanket uh, doctor's health service. And from there, they've got a support network as well. And they have a confidential telehealth service, which you can call and it's you'll get a counsellor and you get three free services with them. Um, but if you didn't want to call them, you can call us as well. And some of the other services here. So there's our one, the, the 92808712, which is the Victorian Doctors Health Program. Um, the Doctors for Doctors number, which is 1300 Doctor for Doctors or 374377. Okay. Um, AMA peer support as well, which operates from about eight to 11 or nine to 10 around that time. And it's completely anonymous as well. And, and something that uh, Kim's involved with this hand in hand peer support network and pandemic kindness as well, movement. Um, the other ones are Lifeline Beyond Blue and a new Black Dog uh, 10 app as well. So th those are things that we kind of, you know, that, that are available for you as well, as opposed to us, not just us. I mean, yeah. 
And, and that's it, really. I, I'd like to keep it short and sweet. It's kind of late. And I'm sure everyone would want to get home or, or not get home. Yeah. Well, f thank you, Long. That's a terrific uh, presentation. It's really good to know for ourselves, but also for our patients who are doctors and having a, a, a hard time. So very helpful. Um, now, the Health Pathways Melbourne has uh, got some pages for um, clinician care and also for self-care and just uh, looking after other doctors. So I think we've got a slide on this. Um, it can be used for your own personal information uh, or for your if you're treating a doctor or other healthcare worker. It does information about assessment for mental health, drug and alcohol use, burnout, work fatigue, or if infected with COVID-19. And it was updated in November 2020. So it's pretty current. Um, <laughs> I would never have thought of uh, to look at this for any resources. So I'm, really, I'm glad I'm doing this uh, webinar. It's now I know about it. It's great. Um, but also there's some management resources for self-help and peer support options. It lists counselling and crisis assistance service and also for doctors needing psychiatric assessment. So um, this is for you to all our attendees to know about, but also to let your work colleagues know that this exists too. It's a really good um, page. So thank you, Health Pathways. Um, so we are a little bit over time. Are there any other questions before we finish? I don't think there are any other questions that I can see. All right, so we're, we're a little bit over time, but I would like to thank our two speakers very much. So thank you to Kim and to Long. That was a terrific presentation. Really good practical take-home advice that we can just start doing now. <laughs> so that's really, really helpful. Um, the attendees will receive um, two RACGP CBD points. Um, our next webinar is next Thursday at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's for strategies for GPs dealing with patients' heightened stress and anxiety. Um, also, when we close this webinar, there will be a survey released as soon as we end. So could you please take a moment um, to just provide your feedback? It's really helpful for us to plan these events. So thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Long. And good night.